So Pat Johnson joined Toastmasters in 1983 and over her 30 years of membership has served in all the roles of leadership in Toastmasters International from the club, area, division, district, and international levels. In 2004, from 2004 to 2006, Pat was elected to the International Board of Directors for Toastmasters. She continued through the vice president roles until 2010, 2011, when she was elected Toastmasters International President and Chair of the Board. Pat is the first Canadian woman to serve in this prestigious role. In 2018, Pat Johnson published her first book entitled Handbook for Building and Sustaining Vibrant Toastmasters Programs for Corporations. This book was the result of lessons she learned both while making calls to corporations about Toastmasters but also from her perspective of working as a director of learning and development in corporate and government environments where she was responsible for the hiring of trainers and companies to deliver education to the employees. She experienced the issue of Toastmasters in the corporate environment from both sides of the desk. Firstly, proposing Toastmasters as an education opportunity, and on the other side of the desk, vetting Toastmasters as an education provider to her employees. She brings this unique perspective to the topic today. Please help me welcome Pat Johnson to present her session entitled, To Rebuild or Reposition. That is the real question to ask your corporate club members. Pat, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam District Director, fellow Toastmasters and members of District 60. What a pleasure to be with you again. I fondly remember those more in-person visits that we've had in the far distant pre-COVID past, and I certainly enjoyed your hospitality at that time. I'm honored to be asked to talk about this very important topic today, and I've talked about this at different times in your district over the years, and so it's great to, as we layer information and share it to a deeper level within the district. So I just want to acknowledge the district team, both present and past, who have put the energy into looking at this initiative. Uh, district 60, as many of you are aware, is very full of uh, and well represented uh, by corporate clubs. Now, let me explain, first of all, what I consider a corporate club. A corporate club, and what I'm going to talk about today, is a club that is situated either in a government agency, a government ministry, or a corporation. It is a considered a corporate club for, by my working definition if the corporation pays for, excuse me, pays for the membership or reimburses for the membership and perhaps also provides time for the employees to attend this. Now, I know some of you are saying, oh, I'm the area director or I'm the president of a corporate club and we pay for our membership and we do it on our own time. My definition of that is a community club who meets inside a corporate building. Because, uh, so I'm just going to, for the purpose of today, ask you to go with me for this paradigm shift. Let's talk about, even if you're, by my definition, a community club meeting in a corporation building, and you would like to be, uh, get assistance from your employer, I want to uh, share some ideas around that. If you're an area or division director involved, with corporate clubs who are struggling with membership or retention of membership or engagement 
or lack of support in the workplace, these are also some ideas I'll present today that you may be able to access in order to problem solve or look at different ways to set up the club. One of the, so I hope that's, that's useful. One of the, the main things of this paradigm shift around corporate and government clubs that I wanna talk about today is the partnership. In the past, and we've built our corporate clubs and through no fault of anyone, I've done it myself. We went in, we took what we knew and, and what we had in our home clubs. And often many years ago, when we started building corporate clubs, we all belonged to community clubs. So we walked in with our agenda from our community club. We brought it to the workplace and we said, here's Toastmasters, let's make it happen. And we didn't sell it. We didn't necessarily give um, the benefits to the organization, but we got permission to meet in a room somewhere on our own time, as long as we didn't make a mess or, or disturb anybody or ask for anything else. And, and I'm being a bit extreme on this, but often we said, oh, we don't need anything. We just need a meeting space. And so we got a meeting space. We never asked to partner with the organization. So what I'm proposing today, if you can keep it in your mind, is what came to me as I sat in that director's chair in the, in the government and in the corporations and thought, what would I actually buy? What would I, would I actually bring this Toastmasters program into the corporation where I'm responsible for the deliverables? Toastmasters isn't responsible. Well, they're responsible to me. But I'm responsible to the CEO for what I bring into that organization in order to train our employees. So I'll ask you to sit on this side of the desk with me for a while this morning so we can explore this uh, whole concept. And I'm going to talk for about 35 minutes, somewhere in there, and then we're going to have an opportunity to have some discussion and hopefully uh, any questions that I can respond to as well. So let's start at the beginning. First of all, if we're going to have uh, a true partnership with a, a corporation, uh, some of the basics are to really think about uh, how you want to begin. So even if you're going to reposition this current club as if you're working as a club coach or an area director or a president and you're having difficulty with membership or retention, as I mentioned, or getting the education done, getting commitment, you could consider repositioning um, your club. So let's start at the beginning. What would we do? Well, the first thing we need to do, whether we're building a new one or repositioning a current one, is to get our mind really clear on what we're doing. The first thing that I would ask you to do and consider is to change your language. So when you think about going to talk to those people in that environment that have the decisions to make regarding training and education, you want to be speaking language that they understand, not Toastmaster language. One of the first things we learn as speakers is know your audience. And knowing your audience in this case is speaking language that the training department or the education department of this corporation or government agency understands. So some simple quick wins, first of all, when you're talking about money and we're talking about education programs here, you wanna talk about tuition. So they understand that that's what they're paying for to get the education. That's, that's an easy win, tuition. Think of when you went to school or university, you all paid tuition for your education. Don't get into the details of pathways, but just talk about the curriculum, that we have an online curriculum. It's um, that we had, um, that we have competencies built into it. Over 300 competencies have been built into the Toastmaster program. That's what the learning department wants to know about. They want to know that it's experiential learning, that we practice 
in our sessions that we are going to have every week. We're going to practice. And that's one of the keys for them to understand that we're going to build skills through practice, that Toastmasters is just not a four, week, a four hour course and then we graduate and we're done. So we need to explain that to them. We need to explain to them uh, that we learn to give feedback because this is a critical transferable skill in the workplace. Every supervisor, every manager needs feedback skills. If we talk about evaluation, it doesn't always uh, translate to feedback in the workplace. So use the term feedback. I do not call them meetings. I have never worked in a workplace in my whole career where people would pay money to go to more meetings or that people would sign up their people to go to more meetings. We're usually looking to get out of meetings. So I talk about them being learning sessions because, or education sessions because I've already said that this is an education organization. So talk about the education sessions when you're talking about the Toastmasters program. I don't get into a lot of details about the president of the club and the vice president membership, et cetera. I talk about, I just refer about to the fact that there are seven leadership roles on, a, on an annual basis that people can participate in, or that could be every six months if you choose to do it that way. So um, think about the leadership roles that exist in that program. So you're going to ask for 20 two to 25 members to be involved in that program at any one time. And that there'll be six or seven, pardon me, seven leadership opportunities also at that time. I talk about critical success factors and or strategic planning that we're working towards objectives. So that's something we learn and that they identify with because work in the workplace, as most of you know, is very objective driven, results oriented. So we want to talk about that. And again, I just reiterate, I don't talk about pathways. What we call it doesn't mean anything to them. They're just interested in the curriculum that we have. So that's just some of the language that I change when I'm going in to talk to um, an organization, and I hope that that's useful for you. When we go to set up this first meeting, whether you're repositioning your club, rebuilding it, or you're going in to build a new, brand new one because you've got a lead for a corporate club, some things to think about. You want to make sure that the club is looking, or you're looking at building a club where it's sustainable, that there's a minimum of 200 employees on site, or um, are they going to have their, their club hybrid? Are they going to have it online? Are they going to have it in person? And I let, in this partnership, the corporation decide what works for them, because they already do business. They know how they do it. And so when I have that very first meeting with them, I'm going in, whether to reposition or build new, I ask them all about the organization. I don't tell them what we're going to do. I ask them how we can do it. So I present the concept of Toastmasters as a not-for-profit education organization. It's experiential learning. We meet every week for one hour. And we would uh, want to set that up during the work day and have that uh, practice time. What we, where I go from there is that I talk about what they bring to the relationship and what Toastmasters will bring to the relationship. I talk to the corporation right up front so they know what kind of deal that we're, we're making here. And we can provide. The... See, remember, if we're sitting and we're the director of learning and development or training, we know that as a corporation, we provide the employees that go to the training. The contractor, who would be Toastmasters, 
doesn't go around the hallways looking for the people to attend the training that they've been hired to deliver. So that's a paradigm shift from what we're used to if we've been in that mode and had our club position differently. So we're going to ask, uh, well, here's what I do. I ask the employer, tell me about your training. How do you, how do you send your employees to training? Do you send them on weekends or after work to training that enhances their performance at work? Or do you provide them time to do that? Where does the money come from for the training that your employees are taking? Do you pay for it? Do you reimburse it? Do you uh, make them pay for their, do they have to pay for their own training? And whatever their answer is, my answer is that'll work for us because they already have a system that works. We need to fit inside their system if we're going to partner. Chances are that a corporation isn't going to change their department and set up and funding uh, processes for us as one contractor. They've got a way that works for them. The other thing I'm curious about is their training money. Is it out into the branches or is it centrally located? Because that'll give us a heads up of the challenges of collecting that tuition every six months. I ask them if they have, if because our curriculum is online, do they have firewalls that will pre prevent their attendees, their participants in this program, from accessing our curriculum? And how do they handle that in-house? I also ask them what their internal processes are for employees to both identify training they want to take, signing up for it, and if their supervisors, managers actually refer employees to the training uh, courses. I want to know all of that. I also ask, and this is something that's critical for you to know as well, how do they hold their employees accountable once they're signed up for training? Do they have them report back? Do they write it in the performance review plan and have expectations? How do they hold their employees accountable? We wanna know that because we're going to have to provide that to that employer because we're the contractor. That's the kind of, uh, uh, a partnership, there we go, partnership that we want to create with them. So then when we, when I answer all their questions, because they have questions about funding, and I answer those, they have questions about how frequently we meet, I always say weekly for one hour. And they'll say that's a lot of time, and I'll say we're building skills, and if we have 22 to 25 people in a room, for one hour every week, not everybody gets to speak. Some people are practicing their listening skills or their feedback skills, and some are practicing their speaking skills. And when we do this for an hour every week consistently, you're going to see skills developed. They're going to run the meetings, they're going to build teams, they're going to do strategic planning, they're going to build teamwork, they're going to change uh, their attitude and morale in the workplace, ultimately. They're going to build self-esteem and confidence in addition to being a better impromptu speaker in all your events and meetings, but also a better presenter and even down to being a good facilitator when there's events within the corporation that they can facilitate or be the MC for or a spokesperson. So there's huge benefits for the corporation. So I translate that, as I just did, in relevant transferable skills for that corporate environment. There's so many um, transferable skills when we think, what do we use at work? We use feedback skills. We teach that. We practice that every week. When we look at 22 people in that room, practicing every week, you're going to see results. Now, why we want to ask for this, because it's always why. 
if Toastmasters doesn't set ourselves up for success and ask for what we need to be successful as a program, we fail. We ruin our reputation and the brand of Toastmasters. So it's our responsibility when we go into the corporation to talk to them, that we let them know that we're a viable education program. We bring a lot of value. And what we need from them is a little bit of money and time. Now, the time will be the stickler in most cases. But I would not give up easily on the time. I usually... If I hadn't given the opportunity, if they say, well, what would that look like? I would say, well, that would, we would pick a standard time like Tuesday from two to three. And we'll book them into one of your training rooms. And every Tuesday from two to three, we have the Toastmasters program run for your employees. I also encourage them then for the accountability part. I ask them in that first meeting or the second meeting, depending on how long we get, because we have to manage that as well. Uh, how do you hold your people accountable? And that's one of the first things that I'm asking them, but then to talk about that. And I, when I have an opportunity to talk with them about that, I explain that Toastmasters doesn't have a graduation. We don't have a pass or fail. It's continuous learning. So you would run the risk in the corporation as the employer of having finding somebody like Wendy Williamson that you can't get out of the program, that she just keeps coming back year after year and showing up to learn more. And so the corporation then has to look or the government agency has to look and say, well, if we're paying and giving time we're willing to do that for each employee that goes into the program, but we're going to cap it at two years. Now that's a very standard practice in my experience. I know our federal government in Canada does that. Um, they cap it at two years because I know a number of people in clubs of that. And there's a number of corporations. So one of that I was, when I was um, training in development, and they had a policy internally that they would pay and give time up to two years for participation. And then after that, it was up to the employee to say, I'm getting a lot out of this. I'm willing to pay to continue in this club and make up the time. Or I'll go and find a community club or another club that I can join outside of the workplace. But we find that many employees stay because they enjoy that. So I think it's very generous when an organization writes a policy so that there's consistency across the organization uh, so that it's not depending on, well, if Nita is a supervisor and Anita believes in continuous growth and development and Pat's a supervisor and she doesn't. So Anita's employees ultimately could access Toastmasters and Pat's couldn't. So this is one of the, another thing that I ask of the organization is how they deal with that disparity or the differences between branches. Do they set policy locally to ensure equity of access to the training? And part of it is, for not me to demand it, but for me to just put it on the table as this could be an issue for you. Now, there's so many variables that exist because the reality is that this Toastmasters program that's inside the corporation may be only for the IT department, funded by the IT department and attended only by the IT department. So, uh, some of those uh, bigger issues may be a moot point, but just if it's for the global uh, organization, have that conversation. I'm also very curious as holding them accountable, how do they have a performance review plan uh, where they put expectations into the, to the employers and the supervisors agreement? This is something that I talk about if they're paying and they're doing it during time. 
because one of the things, uh, one of our challenges in corporate or government clubs is that people get pulled out of the training session because it's seen as a meeting and the supervisor or manager has a much more important meeting for you to be at. Now, how many people have had that happen to you? So it happens all the time. And then we find that, that the attendees lose momentum because they're always being pulled out. It's, it's seen as accept, they're, they're accessible. That goes away for the most part when we have the accountability written into their performance management system, whatever that is. If they have a a employee development plan or they have a learning object or they have objectives and deliverables how whatever they call it if we put the training in there that for example that um, david has applied for the toastmasters program we approve him to attend for uh two up to two years whatever suits suits him and his um, uh, supervisor and that David will be expected to attend up to 80% of the, the session, the learning sessions. Now David has something to go back on if his supervisor's continually pulling him out at that time and say, I'm, I'm struggling to, or however we would say it, we have an agreement that I attend 80%, a minimum of 80% of these sessions. And so can we reschedule our other meeting, because that's our agreement. So it gives both the employer and the employee an understanding of the expectations and requirements to show up. And um, so that that's something else that's very important. I like to, as I said, ask a lot of questions and then assure them that we will fit into their program uh, the way they run their training. We will provide information. If they provide packages for new employer, uh, new employee hires, we'll provide them with the information. We do not let them provide the information because they don't know anything about the Toastmasters program or not to the level we will. So we want to provide them with the information. We want to provide the information to the HR or the training department that's looking after this. So we can get information on the infra, infra, um, intranet or whatever they use to advertise their training events. That's what we want to plug into. So it's uh, really important to set up that partnership, quite a paradigm shift from going to a community and saying, okay, let's find 25 people and form a club. Very, very different. But really think uh, like a corporate uh, manager, think like a corporate employee and what works in that place. Change the language and ask for what we need. We need regular time to practice and ideally paid or reimbursed attendance if that's how they do the other training. It's also really important in the repositioning to think about, and I'm going to switch right now to from that whole perspective and that relationship with the corporation and the um, organization with and Toastmasters to once we get the club set up. So if you've got a club that's currently working and you want to try and reposition it, I would suggest that you need to go back and re-enroll the corporation. It might have been 10 years ago that you got Toastmasters in that organization. And the organization may not know that Toastmasters is still meeting there. Or perhaps it's really turned into a, a group that comes together from a whole bunch of uh, organizations around the, the neighborhood. So if you're interested in reestablishing it as a corporate entity, uh, start and contact those people in learning, education, training, development, whatever they call it, or even HR, if they can be responsible for it. So let's talk a bit about some of the things that you can do within your club to change the structure of your club and the the function of your club to more reflect the corporation. 
So you're a member of a corporate club and you're supported already by the corporation. You're well established, you're meeting, uh, whether you're meeting before or after work hours, whether you're paid or not paid, hopefully, um, though some of that happens at least. But let's talk about how can that club activity be more um, relatable at the club level? How can it be more transferable? Uh, and what my goal always when I put, put training in a corporate environment is that my test is the CEO has arrived and she stands in the doorway of every Toastmasters training session that takes place. Now, think for a moment, if you're running a large organization or a corporation or a government department, what do you want to see happen in a training room that you're paying for and that your employees are in? Well, there's some very specific things that I know the CEOs that I worked for looked for. First of all, they wanted to see that there was some knowledge being shared, that it wasn't people just sitting around and talking. Now, for a moment, set aside that you know exactly what all that talking is about in the meeting. They don't. They've never attended a Toastmaster meeting. They're not, they're not converted. They're not a fan. They're neutral but they're curious. So they're going to observe. I want them to see that we have an education component in that meeting when we're there for one hour. I want to see a well-run meeting that uh, the a general evaluator actually provides feedback on how it could have been um, planned better, how it could have been organized better. Was it set up well in advance? Were there prepared speeches working the Toastmaster program. That CEO, if they walk out of there and say people were just sitting around and answering questions, that is not the to full Toastmaster program. Our criteria in Toastmaster says that in order to be a Toastmaster club, you must have um, meet a minimum of 12 times a year, and you must deliver prepared speeches and have oral evaluations. Those are the criteria to be a Toastmaster meeting or club. So we must, for that CEO and that organization to see us as a valid education program, we must be delivering the curriculum. And that means people are doing prepared speeches to the objectives within that curriculum and making progress. They want to see that we're practicing impromptu speaking because we, we said that's what we would deliver. And we said we would give them feedback skills and listening skills. So they're going to watch for all the things that we said this program delivers. So I would ask that you start by putting a three to four minute education moment in every Toastmaster meeting you hold within that environment. Make it an assigned role on your agenda. Get rid of humor. Get rid of some of the, the maybe the awe counter, maybe have a grammarian instead so there's more of a focus on positivity. Um, whatever is required, really look at your agenda and say, is this teaching a transferable skill for the corporate environment? Or is this a community club agenda? Be really diligent about that. Challenge the members of that group to bring something for the education session when they sign up for that education moment, that they bring a lesson that deals with communication, leadership, listening, thinking, speaking. There's a wide array that they can bring. So make that an integral part of their learning. Then the prepared speeches flow out of that the evaluations, the table topics, evaluate them, and then a general evaluator who's evaluating the entire meeting and the evaluators so that we're building the, those skills. Those are the major components that you want to have. We don't need um, invocation in the workplace. We don't necessarily need an inspiration. They might want to do that uh, if that's the flavor of their organization, but really think seriously 
about what is useful in this environment. What's the culture of the organization? So think about that. The other thing that, and just very briefly, the other thing that I do um, and suggest is that when we have the seven leaders that are identified within the club, that we call them not president and VPs, because that sounds a lot like the structure in a corporation, right? But let's consider that their roles are liaisons. Liaisons to what? What would be a good leadership development opportunity if I'm in a corporate uh, Toastmasters club and I'm building my career and my employer's paying me time and money to go to this training? What would be really good leadership training? Well, how about if the president of the club was suddenly the chief liaison and they were responsible to check in with if there's a corporate sponsor they're going and reporting to that corporate sponsor and letting them know what's happening in the Toastmasters Club. They're holding the executive meetings and they're determining and running the strategic planning, which is the district or the club success plan. They're running that. That's transferable skills that they want to sign up to be one of those seven leaders. Vice President of Education, that we call in in uh, Toastmasters would translate to that education liaison. They're going to work similar to what they would in, a, in another club in terms of the scheduling, but they're also going to have to work really closely with what the, what the goals are and the stated agreements that the employees have with their managers and supervisors. They're also going to work with the administrative person or the club secretary to track the attendance and activities of those members. Because we, as a contractor, need to report back to the person paying us attendance. We've got to be accountable and, and allow them to hold their employees accountable. So we need that um, activity. So the club secretary or administrator, administration a liaison, is going to be gathering that data. So I would say that, you know, along with what Lance Miller often refers to is he talks about 10 speeches in a year's time, 10 um, evaluations in a year, and maybe 12, 15 other roles in a year. So if we have our members showing up and practicing skills like that, in the club, Toastmasters is going to have a great reputation and the organization is going to want us to stay because people are going to come out with some new advanced skills. We look at vice president of membership then, and I call this the, the member, um, the employee liaison. And a lot of this is going to be liaising where? Where are our members coming from? Our members are not coming from the hallways where we meet our friends or around the lunchroom table when we talk people into coming. It's coming from the training department, the HR department. So our, our member, our um, employee liaison person is going to be talking to that department, making sure in conjunction with our public relations liaison that they've got the material that they need. So there's going to be some crossover in information and, and roles, but they can share them. They will also ensure that, that letting them know, hey, uh, Pat's left the Toastmasters program now. She's got her goals. She's not renewing next, next month when we have renewals. We have room for two more uh, participants in the program. So then the training department can fill that. That's really critical feedback for the organization. And that's part of the leadership training in that club. The finance liaison is a great leadership position because they get to work with the Department of Finance and manage the transfer of money between the organization, the government, and Toastmasters International. That's their responsibility as a leader. They need to gather how many members we have, what 
needs to be paid? Do you need an invoice? Do you need a receipt? All of that. That's their leadership opportunity, as well as working with all the other ones on the strategic direction of the club, et cetera, or the, the learning uh, organization. All of those things, the, the secretary or the admin is going to do the data, data gathering. And the sergeant at arms really, for me, becomes the protocol liaison and or even, um, yeah, protocol or um, mm, what's the other word? Well, I, I won't struggle for the word. They oh logistics. They want to be the logistics liaison. So they're managing that we've got a meeting place that it's set up, et cetera. So, again, they've got to take leadership. This works in an amazing way because it gets these people who are the leaders and studying leadership in Toastmasters into the organization and they're seen as taking initiative, having difficult conversations, connecting, building relationships. So a very powerful way to be seen and heard in your organization. So I'm going to stop there because I don't want to get into another whole ball of information that I am um, looking at some, I, I know the chat box is full of questions and um, I'm just going to turn it back to Anita for the process from here. Do we have time for Q&A before we go to breakout rooms or where are we at? I think, yeah, we can have a five minutes Q&A Pat before we, we move to the breakout room. So any questions for Pat? Can somebody check the chat for me and rather than me try to I see a lot it? of uh, I see a lot of positive uh, responses uh, Pat just to let you know love the rule of 10 speeches 10 evaluations 10 to 15 roles a lot of agreement and uh, they really enjoy uh, your presentation uh, we have a question from Louise uh, Bark from our division C uh, director division Yes uh, Louise. Louise Yeah mine's um Partly a question, partly a comment. Uh, and I think what I, one of the first things I'll say is I can very much attest to the use of the language and what how you phrase it. And my club is a, a community club, but even last night it was someone was asking questions about, you know, is there, do we have to do things at a certain pace and so on? And what I, my answer to them was, it's a self-paced education training program. You get out of it what you put into it. And so even in a corporate and a, a, sorry, a community club, that kind of lingo can work. But the key word I found was the most useful is that piece about the training. And then second piece of, especially if it's corporate, is carrying that communication over to let the person in that corporate club know that you're, you're probably getting your, your membership paid for by your boss. So I think the next part I um, want to make sure is that is there a way that we as members can, or sorry, as leaders can communicate to the clubs, especially the members of the corporate clubs, how they can encourage more of that communication accountability with their management teams in their corporations so that it does help strengthen the entire um, corporate club? Because the corporate clubs, a lot of them they disbanded during the COVID, yeah. they're out at home. And I think we need to bring that back somehow. And so how yeah. do we talk to the HR and bring yeah. that back? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is exactly what I was referring to today in terms of repositioning. Uh, if the clubs have failed, you may be rebuilding or you might find some stragglers that you can pull together and you're going to reposition it. I would go right back to the very beginning of the process and go in and meet with the HR or training department and ask the questions and reposition the club as a fully functioning education program where there's accountability for the employees showing up and delivering. That's their skin in the game. People keep saying, oh, the employees have to have skin in the game, they have to pay. I have skin in the game, the expression, when I, my employer sends me to project management, and I have to go up and I have to re report out. They have a process to hold us accountable. They'll do the same thing for Toastmasters if we get in their, pro in their process. We don't have to worry about holding them accountable and getting them through the system. Their employer is driving that. 
And we all know those of us that have, and I'm sure there's some of you amongst us today, in addition to me that have been in running learning and development departments, we know the people that sign up for training and never show up. They're blatantly obvious in the organization because we track attendance and we know who completes or doesn't complete courses. So the first question I would have, if Martha's name showed up on my desk to join Toastmaster, I would say to her supervisor as the employer, how are you tracking this? Because we know we're, we're involved with these people every day, all day long. Supervisors know. I found somebody I used to phone up. If people didn't show up for the program, I'd phone their supervisor and say, Martha's not at, in this session today. What happened? <coughs> Sometimes we found that Martha walked to the mall during the training session. Not my problem, certainly the supervisor and the employee's problem after that. So they hold people accountable. It's, it's integrity in the workplace. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Pat. Uh, we have another question from Andrew Horbury. Or Andrew, do you want to go on to me? National question. Thanks, Adam. Pat, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for this presentation. Hands down, the best presentation I've seen this year in its relevance and applicability. So thank you for all that terrific, terrific content. Um, I, I'm speaking as someone who used to work in marketing and now finds myself in HR. So many of your messages were resonating very strongly with me. And I just wondered, I, have you come across a consistent big objection to what you've proposed or is it different for every single corporation that you've gone into? It's absolutely different for everyone that I've been in. There's some consistency, but um, always with variations. Uh, the biggest challenge usually is to find the right people to talk to and for them to understand that. And, and, and I think the biggest challenge is for us Toastmasters not to undersell Toastmasters and to not be afraid to ask for what we need so we can deliver the product. We undersell our product and what we need. So we set ourselves up, and this is my impression and my judgment, we set ourselves up for failure because we don't ask for the time. We don't ask for their commitment. We don't ask them to send employees to us. How do we run a program if we're not even on the sheet, we're not even in the catalog, we're not even in the awareness? And so... Um, we have to market, we have to enroll them. People say, well, I don't do sales. I said, I don't do sales either. I enroll people in the benefits of this program. Yeah, so just change the language again and it changes our relationship to it. I, I think I answered long for all the, the two questions. So <laughs> we're out of time. We do <laughs> so have... We we do have oh. a few more questions, but I will send it to you directly, Pat, and during the break, if you can take a look at them, um, but we okay. are at time for the Q&A. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Pat, for this insightful uh, presentation. And looking at the comments in the chat today, you have inspired so many of us, and we appreciate you and thank you for mm. your time and uh, giving back what you have learned to District 60 today. So now we will go to our breakout rooms and there will be six breakout rooms and Adam will do his magic. And while you are in the breakout room, we have some work for you. It's not to take a break, but it's a workout room. <laughs> All right, so this is the question. Please discuss and explore the potential of implementing a couple of the ideas, concepts from Pat's presentation for your club within your breakout room, including a timeline for next steps. And please choose someone who will present once you return out, uh, you come back from the main room. And uh, yes, here is the question in the chat and Adam will try to have the question in each of the respective breakout rooms. And yeah, we look forward to hearing back from you. And Pat, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have 10 minutes 
And <clears throat> assuming I did this correctly this time, let me just double check, not like last time. <laughs> Enjoy your breakout room in three, two, one. We do have a couple of guests today. Does oh, actually, where are they? Oh, the guests aren't here anymore. Okay. <laughs> I think they joined just for you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> if everybody wants to take a, it's up to you. You can take a 10 minute break. I can throw up a, uh, a timer for everybody. Oh, now I'm able to share this lovely screen, Pat. Oh, look at that. But I will leave it there until they get back. <laughs> Uh, Pat, it's Andrew here. I've, I've got a couple of questions for you, if that's okay. Yes, Andrew. Do, do we keep a register of, company, uh, of companies that are willing to be references? Because I, I mean, I've been in the corporate world for, for many years. And I, I mean, I've, I've been a service provider of, of various services. And, and we've, whenever we implement a new technology in a company, one of our critical success factors was, will they provide us a positive reference when we go live with them, right? And, and then we could then use that in our sales because we can then say, hey, have a chat with you know, company X over here because we've provided the same service, they can provide you with a reference. Is it possible for us to get a, a list of, or, or, or maybe we should, you know, maybe start thinking about this, but you know, corporations that have incorporated our program that love it, that could then maybe persuade other corporations that we're speaking with who might be a little bit hesitant. I would think that would be a fabulous practice for a district. Um, Toastmasters International has a list of uh, certain companies. A lot of them are American based that, that have Toastmaster programs that certainly give uh, testimonials regarding the, the strength and the benefits of Toastmasters. For example, Bank of America was part of the, one of the interview moderated panels we had during the international convention just passed. And they actually have dedicated staff resources to managing um, as part of their portfolio to managing their Toastmaster pro, uh, programs around the world in Bank of America. Uh, Microsoft, uh, I've visited Microsoft clubs around the world in various locations, as well as Amazon. And their uh, Amazon claims to have also a coordinator that in within staff as part of their HR responsibility is the Toastmasters clubs within Amazon. They, my experience with Amazon is that they're not very hands-on in that coordination role. They might keep track of it, who's in and who's out. But um, so there's varying degrees of involvement and um, and that and all that to say that there are a number of corporations who are certainly willing to uh, give testimony and and speak to the benefits of the Toastmasters program. And I think that would be a great thing to do within a district because then you've got um, you've got somebody just down the street from another CEO that can show up and give a testimony and say, here's the benefits within our organization. And the CEO standing next to him is going, uh, why don't we have that? So, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. it'd be a great thing to build for our district. Is, is that a list of, yeah. of companies willing to give testimonials available on the TI website? Or is that something we can ask somebody at TI for if you want to get started while we build our own list? Yeah, I would definitely uh, write to world headquarters and ask them if there's a list. I have seen lists in the past. So I might, I, I, I would start a Google or a, just a search on the Toastmasters website and see if they have them listed. Um, but I, then uh, depending on the results of that, then I would contact World Headquarters and see if they've got a list. Okay, thank you. And you know, I, I like there's obvious ones already that that you know, like we have the um, CRD in Canada has has clubs across the nation. Sorry, um, CRD, CRD. Yeah, the Canadian, being, yeah. Canadian Revenue Agency. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I'm just, I'm trying to think of um, other, 
other ones we have. Oh, I, you've caught me flat-footed on this one, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it just, it's just occurred to me that sometimes testimonials can be really powerful when you're trying to convince a company. Right? Yeah, we're, we're doing this right now. I'm working with one of the districts and they're having a corporate summit. And what they're doing is by inviting the the high the training department or the CEOs, whatever they can get to attend, to come to the summit to actually give testimony and talk about the benefits that their employees have received from the Toastmasters program. And the uh, the district is inviting other or organizations to come in so that they hear from their peers. Uh, in the corporate world, what is happening and, and the benefits they've seen from Toastmasters. And then from there, they're using those as warm leads to follow up with those corporate attendees. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and just very quickly, my second question was, you mentioned the 10, 10, 15 rule, which I really like. Um, but 10 speeches per year for 20 members is, is, you know, 200, which would mean that you'd have to do four speeches per meeting if you're meeting on a weekly basis. Uh, if it's only an hour long, that might it might not be practical have four speeches, four evaluations. So would, would you then encourage, I mean, and, you know, to make this work, would you then encourage these members to go elsewhere to other clubs to provide their speeches in order to accomplish that? I, I find that people are, are pretty reluctant when they belong to a corporate training program that that's usually because it's convenient and it's also recognition and, and, attack, and is related to their work specifically. So I, I find most of them, generally speaking, I mean, there's always exceptions, but generally speaking, they're reluctant to go out of that uh, environment. I, I like to put it out there to raise the bar to see who, who shows up and tries to do it, because there'll be those people that will agree with their supervisor that they, they'll only give five speeches. Uh, in, in a year because they're absolutely petrified to do this. And five speeches would be a huge achievement for that person. So when we remember that everybody comes with unique differences, they'll, they'll show up in different ways. And then there would be somebody like me that would probably want to speak every second week if I could when I you know got started, <laughs> given that they only give you five to seven minutes at a time. <laughs> <laughs> We have a hand up as well, Pat, uh, from Emmanuel. Um, and just a quick note, we have two minutes and 30 seconds on the breakout room. Thanks so much, Adam. Emmanuel? Thank you so much, Thank you so much Pat. Lovely presentation. I'm actually working on um, my own uh, a presentation of my own for, for uh, starting a corporate club. So that's really helpful. The we question I, I wanted to ask, it, I answered it myself because I did a Google search. On the screen, it was a, a book and I wanted to ask more questions about it. I need to share the slide, but apparently I did a Google search and I found the information. So I've shared it with everyone, but I want okay. to thank you for that. Okay, great. Yes, uh, my book is only available through Toastmasters International. I ha have not made it available in any other form. It's only in print form also. It's not an ebook or an audio book. And it's uh, due for revisions when I hear from Toastmasters. <laughs> yes, it's the book with the long title. <laughs> Big Angela is showing it right now on her screen. Yeah. Uh, I would follow up if we have time with one question, how to deal with rejections in terms of, uh, I'm assuming we uh, are to expect some rejections, right? What's the best approach, I guess? You know, I, I really believe that uh, everybody, anybody that sees the true benefits of Toastmasters would uh, l seriously look into it if it fits their environment. So I don't ever feel that it's, I, I never take it personally. I used to, but I don't ever take it personally anymore. Um, I know that it's usually timing. It's just not the time for them. Uh, they may not have even identified that they have this need, that they need leadership and communication training. And I really define communication not as public speaking. I define it as listening, thinking, and speaking skills, both impromptu and prepared speaking. I don't use the term public speaking at all uh, because they all think that they public speak. They all, they all do speak all the time in public at work. So I really um, emphasize that. So I know it's timing. I know it's uh, unidentified needs. Sometimes it's just that they can't take on one more assignment right now. And 
I'm, you know, if, if they say this is just, this doesn't fit us, I'm, you know, I'm going fantastic. Do you, you know, depending on my relationship with the person, I might say, what, do you think this would be something that would fit in the future? Or is it just not a fit at all for your organization? Um, are, is there a further information that you might want? I, you know, I, I'm not a salesperson, but I, I want to be curious. And that's usually my mindset is just curiosity and total acceptance that it's not for them. And I don't ever want something, a product to go in a place where people are not comfortable with it, don't like it. It's no use because then it's not going to pass. It's not going to be successful because they're not going to put the effort into it and support it. And, you know, uh, then we're back to Toastmasters doing all the work. And that's, that doesn't, that doesn't work, in my opinion. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs>